Thank you very much for uh, inviting me. It's been a fun experience to be here if I ever get the, um, to hear all the uh, talks from uh, different disciplines. And, um, uh, you know, one talk uh, uh, I particularly enjoyed is uh, the talk by Marty Heibloom earlier today. Uh, not surprising, uh, not surprisingly, but, um, uh, you know, I, I, since I worked in that field, I moved to a totally different field trying to understand how uh, patterns of differentiation are formed during development, okay, and how cells adopt different fates in such a remarkably reproducible manner. Now, even though these two fields are quite different, uh, there is a kind of a, an analogy that I see between, let's say, solid state physics and uh, biology, and uh, the analogy is the following, um, you know, the, in solid state physics or in mesoscopic physics, we're often trying to understand the behavior of a complex system based on the interaction of single particles and the properties of the single particles. Okay, and similarly, I would say, or anal analogously, uh, uh, in biology, we're at the stage where we try to understand um, the property of a very complex system, a cell or an organism, based on the interaction of the components within the system, which are, which are the genes and proteins and signaling molecules and so on. Okay? And in fact, in the last couple of decades, we've gained a lot of information about the components that are involved in each step during, let's say, development of a, of a full-fledged organism. Right? Uh, we're at the stage where um, maybe not complete understanding, but we are at the stage where we, we can draw these detailed genetic circuits that underlie each of the developmental processes um, in, uh, 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 during, during development. And, oh, and uh, basically, uh, the problem is that even though we can draw these detailed genetic circuits, we often do not understand how they give rise to the patterns, okay, or to the function. Okay, and this is sort of a, a, a very general problem uh, in biology. And we, we also don't understand how the different components within these circuits are optimized to do the job as components of a circuit, okay? So I'm going to try to address some of these questions in, uh, in the context of uh, one class of developmental patterning process, uh, process which I call uh, fine-grained developmental patterns, okay? These are patterns in which uh, neighboring cells adopt different fates. So here are two examples for that. Um, on the left, you see the uh, uh, differentiation pattern uh, during the development of the inner ear, uh, in this case of a chick, but it's actually very similar to our own inner ear. And maybe we can turn off the lights a little bit, uh, just so that... Okay, and basically what you see here is that um, you have this uh, uh, checkerboard-like pattern of differentiation. The white cells here are going to become the hair cells in the inner ear, and the dark cells that surround each of these white cells is a supporting cell. Okay, now this pattern arises from an initially uniform field of cells uh, in a process which I'll talk about later. It's called lateral inhibition. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, another example of uh, such fine-grained pattern uh, is shown here in the wing of a fruit fly, and you see these uh, uh, veins which are pretty sharply defined, and again, you have a situation where during development, you have the, the cells have to decide whether they belong to the vein on one side of the boundary or belong to the intervein regions on the other side of the boundary, right? So you have to define a one-cell boundary. Um, the, okay, so what I'm, uh, uh, okay, so the, the, the interesting thing about, uh, one interesting thing about these uh, sort of fine-grained patterns that I show here is that both of these systems use the same uh, signaling pathway, uh, or the cells in both of these systems use the same signaling pathway to communicate between themselves, and this signaling pathway is called the notch signaling pathway, uh, which is going to be the main topic of uh, this talk. And the notch signaling pathway is the canonical signaling system 
between neighboring cells uh, across uh, actually all the animal world. All right, so in terms of what I'll talk to you about today is, is the following. Basically, I will start by telling you how we can quantitatively characterize the notch signaling pathway, basically asking the question, what is the relation, functional relation between the inputs and the outputs of the signaling pathway, okay? Then we sh um, I'll tell you a little bit about how the properties that we found, we found which are uh, quite surprising, uh, how they affect the, um, uh, the patterning processes uh, in which the notch signaling is involved. And finally, I'll mention a little bit uh, about the sort of uh, uh, our current efforts to look at the uh, notch signaling or intercellular signaling at the uh, nanoscale level using uh, micropatterning technology. Okay, so a little bit about the notch signaling pathway. The notch is a, uh, as, as a transmembrane receptor. It sits on the receptor of a it sits on a receptor uh, on the membrane of a, of a cell. Um, it can interact with uh, another transmembrane protein, which is called delta. It's actually the ligand for the notch receptor, uh, which is also attached to a cell. So this uh, sort of forces uh, the cells to uh, uh, essentially to get signaling. Two cells have to be in a direct contact. Okay, and, and uh, once uh, notch and delta bind to each other, uh, it leads to a series of events in which the intracellular domain of notch is cleaved. Then it goes to the uh, nucleus and activates downstream genes, okay, the target genes for um, the notch signaling pathway. Interestingly, there's another uh, uh, set of interaction between notch and delta where notch and delta in the same cell can also interact. And in fact, this kind of interaction leads to inhibition of notch signaling. Hold on for a second. Uh, well, never mind. Um, so this is called cis inhibition as opposed to transactivation uh, of the notch signaling uh, with uh, 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 trans delta, with delta on the neighboring cells. So the question that we ask ourselves is how does the notch signaling pathway integrate these two inputs? The uh, ligands uh, delta in the neighboring cells and the ligands in the same cell. And, and basically, what is the functional relation between the output, which is the expression of, a, <laughs> which is the expression of a, a downstream reporter? Uh, and how is the, uh, what is the relation between this output and these two inputs? And maybe more importantly is why this, uh, this system has these two inputs. Why to have both cis and trans delta and how does it affect patterning? Okay, so to uh, basically address this question, we developed this uh, experimental and theoretical platform, which essentially comprises of three sort of main aspects. The first is we take mammalian cells that do not usually express notch and delta, and we genetically engineer them in a way that we introduce the components for the notch signaling system. We also introduce fluorescent reporters, which allow us to uh, follow the dynamics of notch signaling uh, using quantitative time-lapse microscopy. And finally, we use mathematical modeling both to analyze our, uh, our data and to uh, try to understand how the properties of the notch signaling pathway affect the pattern formation processes during development. Oh, yeah. All right, so... Uh, so what we wanted to measure is to measure how notch signaling response depends on both cis and trans delta. And to do that, we take cells. These are CHO-K1 cells. We introduce the notch receptors into these cells. Actually, we introduce a variant of notch receptor where we, we replace the intracellular domain with a synthetic activator. Basically, this is to avoid any sort of spurious effects of activating any endogenous genes uh, in these cells. And we also introduce a fluorescent reporter that turns on when you get signaling, okay? Now, to control for the level of cis delta, delta in the same cell, we also introduce the uh, gene encoding delta. Um, uh, we uh, put it under an inducible promoter, which essentially means that we can induce the expression level of 
uh, delta in these cells using uh, some small molecule. And we, we also fuse a, we also fuse a fluorescent uh, reporter, a red fluorescent reporter to, to delta. Finally, we controlled the level of trans delta by taking delta protein and absorbing it to the plate at different concentrations. So in this way, we can measure the notch signaling response to both cis and trans delta independently. All right, so let's look at um, sort of how uh, it works out. So this is a movie looking at the notch signaling response uh, to trans activation. Basically, these cells are plated on trans delta. In this case, there is no cis delta, okay? No delta in the same cell. They only feel the delta on the, uh, on the surface. And as you can see that as the movie progresses, cells grow and divide, they move around. Uh, but they also uh, start to respond to the signal, and the response is this fluorescence expression in these cells. Okay, now we can take these movies, we can start analyzing it and obtain some uh, uh, data about the notch signaling response. And basically, before I do that, let's think for a second, what do we actually expect to get, okay? So in fact, we can think about sort of two limits for the notch signaling response. Okay, one limit would be uh, maybe notch signaling response would be proportional to the amount of delta. Okay, so in that case, you would have a situation on the left here where you have you have a linear response, and then at some point such saturation uh, of the response. Now, the reason that you might think this should be the case is because the notch signaling pathway is relative is a relatively simple pathway in the sense that one ligands bind to one notch, generating one intracellular domain of notch, okay? At some point, it must go down, right? It must go down into, what do you mean? The finite size of the, of the, of, of the receptor that you can put on the, on the cell compared to how much you can put on the plate. I mean, it cannot be enough, right? Right. Function all the time. Right, right, that's why it saturates. Saturation. Okay, yeah. it will always saturate at some level, definitely, okay? So um, the, the other sort of limit is to say maybe what we actually expect to see is that the notch response would be a, a very sharp switch-like response to the level of uh, uh, trans delta. Um, and the reason you might expect that it should exhibit this kind of uh, behavior is because we know that notch signaling is involved in cell fate decisions where you want to have a binary decision. A cell is, you know, is either becoming a hair cell or a supporting cell, but not both, right? So um, this, uh, this kind of a, a sharp switch-like behavior uh, is, is shown here. And basically, the, the way we fit our function is we, we use these phenomenological functions, which are called Hill functions. And basically, if n, uh, the, the exponent here, if n is equal to 1, this corresponds to a graded response. And if n is much bigger than 1, you get the nonlinear switch-like response. Okay, uh, so let's go back to the movie. This is a film strip from the movie. Uh, we have quite a bit of uh, analysis. We can follow a uh, single cell, track single cells along this movie and obtain the fluorescence. And then we take the average of the sing single cell responses. And this is what we see on the left. On the left, you see the, the fluorescence as a function of time. The top curve here corresponds to the movie that I just showed you. Fluorescence increase. Uh, as, as, uh, as we see. And, and we can repeat the movie, this movie for different levels of uh, trans delta, of plate bound delta, and we get the uh, different curves with different slopes. Okay? And now we can plot the slope, the production rate, which is the output of the signaling pathway as a function of plate bound delta, okay, which is shown here, and we fit it to a Hill function, and basically we get a Hill coefficient of somewhere between 1 and 2. And that's a 95% confidence interval. Okay, so basically we can say it seems like the notch signaling response to trans delta uh, is pretty graded. Now, what happens with respect to um, what happens uh, with respect to uh, cis delta? Okay, so to measure the notch signaling response to cis delta, we use this uh, experimental trick. Okay, basically what we do prior to the beginning of the movie we induce the cells to express high levels of cis delta, 
And then at the beginning of the movie, we remove the inducer. Okay, and we essentially let the level of cis delta uh, slowly decay as a function of time. Maybe it's similar to uh, what Marty talked about, the uh, 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 decay of the magnetic field in, uh, uh, in uh, 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 the uh, uh, measurements of the, the uh, um, interference in, in these uh, interferometers they talked about. Okay, so basically, it's a way to slowly scan the levels of cis delta as a function of time. Okay, so let's look at the movie like this, okay? Um, basically, you see now the cells express high levels of cis delta. This is the red fluorescent protein. And as the movie progresses, you will see that the level of cis delta slowly goes down as a function of time. And then after a while, you start seeing the notch signaling response turns on. So basically, at the beginning of the movie, at high levels of cis delta, there is inhibition of notch signaling. And then later on, this inhibition is removed as the level of cis delta, uh, uh, as the level of cis delta goes down. Okay, and this is basically uh, this film strip from this movie. This is the level of delta M cherry, del delta uh, the, with red fluorescence uh, decaying as a function of time. Um, and this is the notch signaling response. And what you see is that it's initially not responding at all, and then it turns on. And I want to point out that the turn on seems to be rather fast. And by rather fast, I mean that it takes a much shorter time to turn on, to turn on from almost no response, which is a zero slope, slope, to maximal response, okay, which is a maximal slope here, okay, compared to the decay time of uh, uh, delta. Okay, now that's a population average measurement. Okay, what happens if we look at single cells? Okay, in fact, if we look at single cells, we see, we, we see an even sharper response. So, again, this is uh, one cell uh, delta levels decaying slowly, and the response seems to show nothing, 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 and then, boom, turns on abruptly, right? A very switch-like behavior with respect to cis delta. And we can analyze this, and basically we find that the heel, effective heel coefficient in this system is uh, uh, for this cell is 22 plus minus 10. Again, it's a 95% confidence interval. The uh, median uh, uh, hill coefficient is about 12. So it's a very sharp switch-like response to cis delta. Now this is in stark con contrast to the response to trans delta. So the same receptors, okay, the notch receptors, uh, seems to seem to respond in a graded manner to delta on neighboring cells compared to in a very, uh, to uh, uh, delta in the same cell where they respond very sharply, okay? So we were quite uh, surprised to see that. And uh, uh, we were thinking of, you know, what's going on here, uh, and I'll talk a, uh, about it in a second, but basically um, uh, what I want to show you beforehand is how, the, how we can measure the notch signaling response to both cis and trans delta. So this is the sort of two-dimensional input-output uh, uh, relation of the uh, notch signaling pathway. Uh, this is the fluorescence. Okay, this uh, corresponds to time, which is translated to decay of cis delta. The first curve here is the movie that I just showed you, the, the turn on, the sharp turn on. Okay, the, now we can repeat the same movies for different levels of trans delta. And you see that they all show this uh, sharp turn on. And if you look at the slopes of the green lines, okay, they all, okay, I can't show it. Uh, they all change uh, the, the slope the, uh, with respect to trans delta seem to change very gradually. Okay, so again, uh, this uh, difference in behavior between cis and trans delta. Okay, so how can we explain uh, this observation? So basically, um, uh, we came up with a relatively simple model that it can account for these observations, okay, which is essentially based on you know, one key assumption. Okay? And the key assumption here is the following. We assume that notch and delta in the same cell can bind to each other and form an inactive complex. Okay? So it's not only that delta inhibits notch, it's also that notch inhibits delta. So th we call this the mutual inactivation. Uh, mutual inactivation. Our model also 
so this is the kind of in interaction uh, describing the, the notch and delta. Uh, it's this delta. There's also an interaction in our model between notch and trans delta, where notch and trans delta can bind to each other, and that generates the signal, which is the intracellular domain of notch, which goes to the nucleus and activates uh, downstream targets. Okay, so we can convert it to a, a set of differential equations describing the levels of free notch, free delta, and signal, and then we basically can simulate the experiment, and even without playing this, with the parameters too much, we can see that we can easily capture the, the observation of the experiment. Basically, we see the sharp response with respect to cis delta and the graded response with respect to trans delta. Okay, now, uh, still the question is where does this switch-like behavior comes from? Okay, what sort of gives, gives rise to, to this uh, sharp switch that, that we observe? And basically, to, to, to understand that, let's consider a single cell expressing both notch and delta. Okay? And we can ask how much free notch and free delta does this cell have? Okay, so this is shown here. We change, we vary the production rate of delta, we fix the production rate of notch, and we ask how much free notch and free delta does this cell has. Okay? And what we see is the following. Okay? If delta production is below the notch production, so that's on the left side here, we have the fall oh. We have the following situation. Uh, basically, you have cells. Uh, in, in this situation, most of the delta is bound in these inactive complexes. Okay, and you have excess of free notch. So this cell can receive, but cannot send. Okay. On the other hand, uh, if you have more delta than notch in a cell, then you have a situation where most of the notch is bound in the, these inactive complexes, and you have excess of free delta. Okay? So this cell can send, but does not receive. Now, if the interaction between the notch and the delta is strong enough, uh, the, the switch between them, uh, uh, these two states, is very, very sharp. Okay? Now, this is a little bit like a walkie-talkie, right? You can either talk or uh, listen, but not both. Okay? So that's the, the situation here. Now, the, which is maybe the, sort of the main message of this talk is that this, this interaction essentially forces the cell to, be, to choose between either a sender or a receiver, and, or, but not both. Okay? And why this is important? It's important because it helps um, cells, uh, it, it helps uh, uh, generating self-fate decisions during the developmental patterns, as, as, we'll, see, as we'll see next. Okay? Um, questions so far about this? Yeah. Uh, the purification of the free delta and free notch effect is really uh, by, I don't know if you thought about it, by using thread really determining the relative amount of associated cis notch mm -hmm. cut and see really whether you. Uh, Right. Uh, there, there are d different ways to, to verify that. You know, one way that we're thinking is related to FRET, but, but it's not FRET. It's still the, sort of a, an interaction detection scheme that I'll be glad to talk about. But FRET, FRET is another option. Another way to test that is to see how much uh, free notch or free delta you have on the surface using some sort of uh, adsorption assays. And, and this has also uh, been, been done. Okay. And, and we have other ways to sort of verify the the, the properties of the, 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 this model. Mm. But generally, co conceptually, you, you may have a receptor which is protein that has two binding sites, really. regulatory and active one. And you may you know, uh, regulate it in the active side. So, uh, I mean, you can use such, such type of modeling as well here. I mean, you don't have to use the free on the sender and the free on the receiver. I mean, it's a single model, but really the competition between.
No, but the model of competition actually does not, uh, is not uh, produce this sharp switch-like behavior, okay? We can uh, discuss this. Yeah, that, good, yeah, just the model of competition does not, uh, does not account for this. Okay, so what we ask yourself next, next is the point, uh, how does this mutual inactivation mechanism affect patterning processes like the checkerboard-like pattern uh, in the inner ear or the, the boundary uh, uh, formation. And we can ask the, or put the, this uh, question in a slightly different form as a mechanism which is based on mutual inactivation perform better under some metric than uh, a mechanism without it. Okay. Now, I'm going to skip uh, the story about the sharp boundary, even though it's a beautiful story. Okay, and I want to switch to, uh, directly to the lateral inhibition uh, story. So how does mutual inactivation affect lateral inhibition? And before I talk about uh, the role of mutual inactivation, let's first try to see how uh, do you, uh, how do you uh, generate this kind of uh, checkerboard-like patterning from an initially uniform field of cells, right? There's, there's some sort of symmetry breaking process that, that uh, uh, is, is going on here. And basically the, the model that has been suggested for more than 20 years now is the following, that at some point during development, all the cells in the tissue start sending inhibitory signals to each other, uh, saying, do not turn into a neuron, or do not turn into a hair cell. So everybody says to everybody else. Now, of course, if everybody's just inhibiting everybody else, nothing happens, right? So the, there is another component which is required, and, and in fact, this component is a feedback uh, mechanism. Uh, this feedback is such that Notch signaling uh, produces inhibitors of delta or uh, down-regulating delta in some way, okay? Now, it turns out that it is sufficient with this kind of process to uh, generate this kind of checkerboard-like pattern. Uh, why? Okay, what's going on? Basically, um, if you have cells that are initially uh, identical to each other, uh, there still could be fluctuations. So let's say one cell has slightly more delta than its neighbor, so it's sending more signal. If it's sending more signal, it's suppressing delta in the neighboring cell. This results in less signal in the first cell, and therefore more delta in the first cell. Right? So this is a positive feedback. Okay? And that positive feedback, you end up with a situation that you know, one cell ends up with a high delta level, and its neighbor ends up with a, relative, uh, with a low uh, delta level. Okay, and if you apply this kind of uh, feedback on a, a field of uh, cells, you can get this kind of patterning. Okay, now, um, what we wanted to ask now is whether uh, the lateral inhibition model, um, how does the lateral inhibition model is modified when you add the mutual inactivation, where, 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 when uh, you essentially allow notch and delta uh, to interact also in the same cell. Okay. Uh, okay, and what we do is the following. We essentially uh, uh, do a stability analysis uh, for both of these models, the model of the classical lateral inhibition and the lateral inhibition with mutual inactivation. And we ask over the parameter ranges uh, for, for uh, this model, um, where, uh, under which parameters do you get patterning and which parameters you do not get patterning. And what you can show, also analytically, is that the classical model, in order to get patterning, it requires the feedback to be cooperative or nonlinear. So if it's described by the same Hill function, this Hill coefficient has to be uh, bigger than 2, in fact, here. So if you, get, if you have a, a cooperative feedback or a nonlinear feedback, you have a, the ability to pattern a pretty large range of parameters, uh, even in the classical lateral inhibition model. Okay. Um, however, if you look at the uh, uh, a situation where you have no cooperative feedback, uh, this model cannot support patterning whatsoever. Okay. The mutual inactivation, on the other hand, um, uh, can pattern even if there is no cooperative feedback whatsoever. But basically, the mutual inactivation mechanism provides the nonlinearity which is required for this system in order to uh, become unstable and, and generate patterns. 
No, you have to have the feedback for, for this mechanism. It's just that the feedback here cannot be linear feedback. Okay? It has what to... Uh, meaning that uh, the amount, the suppression on delta cannot be uh, linear with respect to the level of signal. It has to be nonlinear. Okay, we can also, um, okay, I'm finishing in two minutes. Okay, we can also uh, uh, look at the dynamics and, and, uh, of uh, patterning and how fast patterns are formed. And we show that with the mutual inactivation, you get a much, you get much faster uh, patterning. Um, I wanted to spend uh, just one more minute on sort of our uh, uh, current directions. Uh, so maybe just to summarize here, uh, what we show is that the mu with the mutual inactivation mechanism, uh, it's much easier to get patterning than without this mutual inactivation. Okay, and this is true both for this kind of uh, checkerboard-like pattern and with the generation of sharp boundaries. Okay. Now, uh, just to spend one, one more minute on um, um, sort of our current uh, direction, uh, the current direction of my lab, and one of the directions is uh, probing, uh, I'm interested in probing intercellular signaling at the nanoscale level, and the motivation for that is the following. Um, we, as you may imagine, cells in the real system, they're not really these uh, beautiful hexagonal cells that we uh, uh, take in our um, uh, mathematical models, right? They have uh, uh, different morphologies, and in fact, the morphologies uh, of a cell is actively controlled during development for, for different cells, uh, as we've seen before. And uh, when you change the morphology of the cell, you affect the connectivity of cells uh, of, one, of each cell with other cells, and you also affect the uh, contact area between cells. Okay. And in fact, if you look at the example that I gave before, the chick inner ear, you see that in late, later stages there are uh, morphological changes that occur for uh, the future hair cells uh, and the supporting cells, um, and uh, these. Uh, morphological changes also affect the ability to signal between uh, cells. Okay, and the question that I'm interested in is to ask how do cell morphology affect cell-cell signaling? Okay, and uh, so that's sort of at the, uh, at the, one cell, at, at the uh, shape of the cell uh, level, and, and we can also ask a question about the uh, distribution of the receptors and ligands and how does the distribution of the receptors and ligands on the plasma membrane and on the interface between cells affect cell-cell uh, signaling and, and of course uh, the, the, the patterning processes. So to do that, uh, to sort of try to answer the, this question, we need to control, uh, we, we need the ability to control cell morphology, sort of to take cells uh, and control the, the, the boundary between them, and also to measure local distributions of uh, receptors and ligands. And uh, basically what uh, we've been working on is developing this micro-patterning technology, uh, which is done in collaboration with uh, Christopher Chen from uh, UPenn. Uh, this uh, micro-patterning technology essentially uh, allows us to uh, uh, pattern the surface of a glass so that we can stick cells in certain places and not in others. Um, you do some uh, soft lithography, uh, generating a PDMS stamp. You put the PDMS stamp on the glass. Then you uh, flow agarose in between the, uh, the, this uh, sandwich. Okay? And, and finally, you can uh, grow cells uh, in between the, those uh, agarose uh, uh, mesas okay? within these uh, uh, shaped regions. And basically, why, why, why is it good for us is because we can make what we call the two-cell assay. We can take two cells, put them right next to each other right, with the control geometry. We can control the length of the boundary between the two cells based on the, the pattern of lithography. Okay, and we can uh, generate a situation where we have one uh, uh, receiver cell expressing notch and one sender cell and follow the dynamics. Okay, and, and that'll, um, 
allows us to uh, measure the distribution of notches, uh, receptors, and ligands in a controlled manner. Uh, also, hopefully, using uh, superior resolution microscopy technique, uh, which uh, we'll get into in the future. So I'll skip the summary, and uh, these are the people that uh, have been involved in. Uh, thank you very much. knows that he has to send the feedback to the other. What do you mean? What? You describe the mechanism that one cell sends a... a uh, with with the la la this uh, lateral inhibition? Okay, so basically uh, what happens in the, uh, let's say, the inner ear is that uh, the feedback it exists in each of the cells. It, it's, it's there for all the cells and it's, it's similar. Right? It's just that Due to fluctuations, okay, you, you would have one cell that you know, has slightly more than the other, and that drives the, the feedback to a sort of unstable situation where you know, one cell becomes a sort of a high cell and the other one's a, a low cell. Okay. Yep. Okay, since it is. Um, since it is a, a, a direct cell-cell contact, the, the notch signaling, basically the length scale is, is of one cell length. Okay? So you either get on, off, on, off, on, off, it's, if it's a one-dimensional, or on, off, off, on, off, off, on, off, off. Okay? You cannot get, uh, with this mechanism, you cannot get... Uh, uh, what extra Right, so, so this, for example, with, with the stripes in the zebrafish or, or spots on, um, uh, um, on, um, uh, uh, on tigers and so on, people are thinking more about uh, Turing patterning. Okay? In Turing patterning, uh, you have situations where you have diffusible signals. Okay? You have a, a long-range inhibitor and a short-range activator, and what determines the size is the diffusion length scale. Okay? And, since in this situation the cell cell con the, the signaling is uh, only between neighboring cells, there is no diffusion, and right? it always happens on a short length, length scale. Thank you very much. So, next speaker is Dan Steinberg.